Hello and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kellett, your host. A little sad about this week. It's a short week. I feel so happy on uh, Mondays when I get to come here and do the show and so ha- glad that you are here with us. And of course, a great Monday show. Second hour, Carlo is going to be here, Carlo Broussard. And then this hour, Trent Horn, tips for defending the faith. Hi, Trent Horn. Howdy, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah. Are you about to have turkey or are you, are you eating something else for Thanksgiving? Uh, you know, that's a big Thanksgiving debate. But really? I, I, I'm... I don't particular—I'm not a team turkey person. I would be more, I think, a team, uh, a nice honey-baked ham. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess the ham is the uh, the backup for those who—I mean, nobody really likes turkey. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's turkey, you know? I but, mean, turkey is what you have, like, I need to quick make a sandwich for tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, Oh, right. good, I've got some turkey. Right, exactly. It's like, yeah, I don't think—I don't think that's, that's got controversial. Um, or even—it doesn't even have to be ham— I, Thanksgiving, I think, is more like enjoy time with family, be thankful, and just eat kind of whatever you you feel like. I think I, you're leaving out the most important word associated with Thanksgiving, and I don't mean to get all preachy on you here, but pie. Ah, uh, yes. Um, you know something I learned actually today? Uh, so I went to a wonderful Friendsgiving uh, this past weekend. And people uh, brought different dishes and things like that. Someone brought a pumpkin cheesecake, which is interesting because then I start to think, how much different is that from a pumpkin pie? But then I learned, you know, is is cheesecake is it a cake or is it a pie? I know it's a very that that too is a great debate, and I I do not approve of friendsgiving, and I'll tell you why I don't approve of friendsgiving, because you're not supposed to do Thanksgiving with people you like. You're supposed to do it with family. Well, that's why you have friendsgiving. Oh, all right. <laughs> it's like have, it's like friend. Oh, sorry, Trent. or, or fr- friend Year's today. Eve. Friend Year's. Uh, oh, they have that friend Year's Eve. Or friend to ween when you go to a friend's house and ask for candy. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're which is yeah. there every other week for me. And also, by the way, about the cheesecake thing, it's neither a pie nor a cake. I think technically it's a tart. Well, now watch your language. The number is 888-318-7884, 888-318-7884. Tips for defending the faith with our own Trent Horn today, uh, 888-318-7884. Um, you know what I just realized as we're having this conversation? We have like Mother's Day, Father's Day, all these. We, there's no friendship day. Is there a friendship day? Oh, my gosh. Every other day I look online because I think it was Transgender Awareness Day the other day on Twitter. And I don't know. I feel like there's a gazillion um, holidays. We need a friendship day, and I propose it be in August. Perfect time to get together with friends. August. And nobody goes to work on that day. Sai, that was amazing that you said that. I just looked it up. International Friendship Day, July 30th. Well, I'm, I'm not a communist. I don't want it to be international. I want American Friendship Day. All right. Oh, let's see. Okay. Oh, wait. Here we go. Oh, look at this. National Friendship Day. There we August go. That's 7th. what I'm looking for. Which day is it? Well, I don't know. Suddenly, there's another one that says <laughs> August 1st. So I don't know. There could be, um, they might be the heretics who Man, celebrate on we August We need a 1st. holiday. We need a holiday in but August. That's, that's, that is quite amazing to me that I see they're all around end of July, beginning of August. Do you think that's the best time to get together with a friend? No, we need it's another true. day off we'll in August. We need a, a, another free day. This is, I mean... There's not enough free days in America. You know, in France, they actually, I, this, I don't know this for a fact, but this is what I've heard about France. Every other day is a holiday. So you go to work one day, and then the next day is a holiday, and then the next day you work. We should be more like I France. Th- I think the next day is a holiday, Cy, because the uh, transportation workers are on strike again. <laughs> well, good for them. They, should, they, they need to be <laughs> more respected by the French people. 888-318-7884, the number. I have no idea what Trent and I are talking about. We're just... Uh, it's got that Monday feeling to start, so I think I better go to the phones. You want to um, do some actual work, Trent? Uh, yes, as opposed to simulated work. Okay, fair enough. John in Allentown, Pennsylvania, listening to EWTN on Channel 130 Sirius XM Satellite Radio. You are first up. Tips for defending the faith with Trent Horn this hour. Go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking my call. I have a quick question. <clears throat> Um, with the Hail Mary, a lot of times, mm. you know, I see in some Bibles it says, uh, the angel Gabriel said, Hail Mary, full of grace. And then 
in some Bibles I say uh, Hail or, or Mary, most favored one or something. Yeah, what, yeah, sure. What is the best translation for that? Well, I or think what either— what was actually can... said. Well, sure. Well, what was actually said, uh, well, we could bring up, uh, let's see, Luke 1, 28, we'll do a interlinear, because this is the problem when it comes to when it comes to translation. What is recorded in the Greek text, uh, having come to her, the angel came to her, said, a ren, he said, kaire, or greetings, kekaretomene, ho kurios uh, metasu, the Lord is with you. So the, the first part of the greeting is kaire, greetings, and then the part that gets translated uh, full of grace, favored one, really looser out there would be like highly valued daughter. Uh, that one I think is really is really well we're really on the on the limits there is um is this Greek word uh kekara tomene uh so mm -hmm. I believe kekara tomene is in the I think it's in the should be in the perfect uh, it, the, it's the perfect tense um the, uh it is a uh uh perfect participle let's see here the, the point is, so it's this Greek word, kekaratomene, from, from the Greek word uh, grace, karatu. Uh, grace, of course, is favor. What grace is, is that it's God's divine favor that is given to us. And so, right. uh, high, you know, one who is highly favored is one who has received God's grace or favor, either one. Uh, I think full of grace is an, ex is an acceptable translation. It is a good translation. And even other Protestant scholars uh, have recognized that. Uh, so if you look at John A.T. Robertson, who is a Protestant scholar, I think from the early 20th century, he, he commented in a work, he said that the Vulgate, the Latin translation, the Vulgate, gratia plena, so in the Vulgate it would say gratia plena, full of grace, is right if it means full of grace which thou hast received. Uh, I think some people don't like the translation full of grace because the word full is not present. In Greek, it would be pleres or pleres. Another way to write the term full of grace in Greek would be pleres karitu. Uh, but there's other uh, passages in Scripture where we often translate it as the word full, uh, without like that Greek word uh, pleres being present. So uh, Ephesians 6.11, for example, is sometimes translated, put on the armor of God or put on the full armor of God in the NIV or the NASB. But the word pleres is, uh, I believe, is not actually in the verse, but in the context, it is present there. So kekara tomene, uh, when you look uh, in different Greek grammars, it does talk about how it can refer to being uh, completely endowed with something, uh, something one has had throughout one's existence. Uh, I talk about this so a little bit in my could book. You say, Sorry. Could you say that that would mean you're completely endowed with God's favor, or, or as well as you're completely endowed with God's grace? Sure. Well, what, do you think you, there's a difference or, right? between— Right. Do you think there's a difference? No, I don't. No. I'm trying, mm -hmm. to make it, I'm trying to make the case to, to someone that it's the same. I agree with that. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I what, think you could. Yeah, because other other Bible translations render it as favor. Like favor and grace can kind of be interchangeable in that in that context. The point is that Mary has received a, a special favor or grace or gift from God, whichever term you want to refer to it. Uh, she has received solely from Him and in a kind of perfect and enduring way. Yeah. No, um, that's cool. That's what I that's answer my question right on the money. Oh, oh thanks, guys. okay. Great. That, that is Glad a good to start to the week. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. Right on the money is where we want to start uh, the week out. Uh, we got to take a quick break. It's Tips for Defending the Faith. If you'd like tips from Trent Horn, author of a whole bunch of books, including Why We're Catholic, uh, you are welcome to call 888-318-7884. Maybe it's something that you yourself uh, need some help with, or maybe it's something you want to help someone else with. 888-318-7884. At shop.catholic.com, we want you to know that we've got Black Friday deals going on all day, every day. Uh, first, there's our store-wide sale. We've got hundreds of great deals at shop.catholic.com, and they're all on sale. Everything, every book, Every online course, DVD, ebook, MP3, video, and more marked down from 10 to 25%, and more 
some over 50%. Just head over to shop.catholic.com and see what the savings look like. Catholic Answers Live. Are you a coffee drinker? If so, you can now enjoy a coffee roasted to perfection by the Carmelite Monks of Wyoming. Delicious Mystic Monk coffee is roasted and prepared by monks in a hidden cloistered monastery and is available in over 25 varieties. All Mystic Monk coffees are works of perfection and labors of love. For more information on how to purchase Mystic Monk coffee, visit mysticmonkcoffee.com. That's mysticmonkcoffee.com. Wherever you are in the world, you can access the EWTN Global Catholic Network. It's everywhere. You can get EWTN's great Catholic programming on your car radio, at home on your TV, computer, or smart speaker. With EWTN's app, you can take EWTN everywhere on your phone or mobile device. If you want your news in print, turn to EWTN's paper of record, the National Catholic Register. EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. I'm Cy Kelly, your host. We're going to have uh, new programs for you uh, Thanksgiving Day and the day after Thanksgiving, so don't think we're abandoning you or walking away from our responsibilities. As a matter of fact, Thanksgiving Day is with Father Hugh Barber, so that'll be a lot of fun. And then uh, Friday this week is uh, one of those one of them panel shows we do with uh, Joe Heschmeyer and uh, Chris Jack. And we're going to you know kind of review what's been in the news, what's been in the Catholic news uh, over the course of the last year. So Thursday and Friday, we got you covered. Uh, right now, we got you covered with Trent Horn, 888-318-7884, the number, 888-318-7884. Um, uh, Trent Horn. Can, yes, are, sir. Oh, I wasn't sure if you were still there. I didn't see you for a minute. For some reason, I you you were obscured, and I didn't see you for a minute. Um, so uh, you're done traveling for a while, I would assume then, right? No more traveling for you till after Thanksgiving? No, uh, actually, I'm not traveling again until the latter part of January when I will be speaking at the Pro Life Summit in Washington, D.C. Oh, good. Uh, I think that's, I believe that's January, I want to say the 22nd. So maybe that'll be two months from now. Is that related to the, um, the uh, Walk for Life? Yes, Wait. it should. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's related. I don't know if it's around the same uh, time period. Because the March for Life, or the Walk for Life, March for Life, it's Walk for Life in D.C. Oh, I think it's around the same weekend. Yeah, so January 21st, 2022 is the March for Life in Washington, D.C. And then you can go and check out, there's still time probably to register the Pro-Life Summit, which used to be called the uh, Students for Life of America Conference. Uh, It's now called the National Pro-Life Summit because other groups are involved. Uh, Students Life of America, Alliance for Defending Freedom, uh, a lot of groups working together. You can check that out at ProLifeSummit.com, and I will be one of the keynote speakers actually there. So um, with a lot of other people as well. So should be should be great. Very good. <laughs> I'm glad you got all get all that holiday time with the family too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tom in Tennessee is next, listening on EWTN. Tom, go ahead with your question for Trent. Hey Trent, thanks for taking my phone call. Thank um, glad to be here. You- I want to ask you about Vatican II in uh, the new Mass. I personally attend um, the New Order Mass, and I know some stuff came out from the Council that maybe wasn't intended to be a part of the Mass, maybe like communion in the hand, um, Eucharist and ministers, altar girls. And I was just curious if you can explain that. Like, obviously, that's kind of a normal thing now, but does that any way, like, disrespect the Mass or cause any kind of error um, in any way? Sure. Uh, and I will confess here that that I don't have, I haven't gotten into a, a lot of the debate surrounding um, the implementation of the liturgy or particular um, liturgical preferences. I think there have been a lot of, uh, this this came up a lot, I discussed it on my, on my podcast actually, back when Pope Francis released the Moto Proprio Traditiones uh, tradition, traditionis custodias, which was uh, a motu proprio dealing with restrictions on the celebration of the Latin Mass, uh, or the uh, what's been what, what has come to be called the extraordinary form of the Mass, or the Latin Mass. And I didn't really weigh in on that. And I think that th- this is a particular policy that I've that I have adopted in what I'm going to speak about. 
which is I'm trying to really focus on defending the Catholic faith from critics who say that it's false. I know among Catholics there are some very strong feelings about how the liturgy ought to be celebrated, what is reverent and what isn't reverent. I think, though, there that when you read, there's this running joke. In fact, a few... <laughs> A few years—I don't know if I should—I'm oh, too late. I'm going to say it now. A few years ago for Halloween, I dressed up as a ghost with, like, you know, classic ghost with a sheet over my head, cut out eye holes. And then I put a bunch of uh, what's liturgical uh, abuses and things like that written on, written on the costume. And people asked me what I was, and I said, the scariest costume of all. I'm the spirit of Vatican II. Ooh. <laughs> Because there's a uh, sigh is rolling his eyes. Uh, yeah. No, no, that was brilliant. Uh, yeah, he's smirking at the thought. Yeah, so I was the spirit of Vatican too. Because I think a lot of people, you'll hear people say, oh, well, it's okay to do this kind of aberrant uh, liturgical practice or even something that is contradicted by the general instruction of the Roman Missal and say that it was part of the spirit of Vatican II. And it's a very elastic phrase. Um, that can lead to abuses, because when you go back and you actually read the documents for themselves, uh, you can see, like in Sacrosanctum Concilium, uh, there are many lofty goals, and what is proposed is actually uh, quite minimal, for example, uh, as to what, what should be done uh, with the Mass compared to sometimes what we have today, whereas uh, like, like, the, um, like the Second Vatican Council, for example, never forbade the use of Latin, uh, especially in things like the antiphons or other parts of the Mass. Uh, you, you can see, I think the goals are very lofty. That's, I love the, my favorite line in Sacred Sanctum Concilium is um, uh, uh, that the desire in the liturgy is for there to be full, active, and conscious participation. And I think that's that's important. We, should, we shouldn't just go to Mass and just everything kind of breezes past us. And that doesn't mean, of course, that the traditional Latin mass inhibits full active conscious participation. It does not. But I think that when elements are included to facilitate that, it's a good thing. But I, I do think, though, that in giving freedom to ministers to adopt different things to accomplish this goal, I do think some of it um, can be abused and a lack of reverence can um, can occur in this regard. Um, there is a new book. Oh, goodness. I, I wish that I could... Um, it was just, it was actually, I just received it um, in the mail and it was sent to me as a review. And I was, it was, it was on uh, the implementation of the Second Vatican Council and where, where it was done correctly and where, you know, it's not necessarily done as well, the implementation of the council. Um, I can't find it here. If, if I, I know, I should have my wife run, run it up to me. And then maybe I could uh, share it on air for people to listen to, or maybe someone in the chat or on Facebook can let Sino. It's a new book that it just uh, that's I, just I, come I mean, out. I think it's I, I think know. it's published through. Oh, I got it. I got it right here. Actually, it's called Reclaiming Vatican II by Blake Britton. There we go. That's the book. So I would recommend by Father Blake Britton if you would like to um, go deeper on that to see understanding the Council uh, and these things that can be implemented incorrectly from it. The new book that just came out in October by Father Blake Britton, B-R-I-T-T-O-N, so not like Great Britain, B-R-I-T-T-O-N. The book is called Reclaiming Vatican II, What It Really Said, What It Means, and How It Calls Us to Renew the Church. So that might be a resource I'd recommend there. And uh, I'll say thanks. We'll leave it there because there are lots, well, as a matter of fact, every single line full at the moment. So I want to keep going, make sure that Trent uh, gets a chance to talk to as many folks as possible. Tips for Defending the Faith with Trent Horn this hour, uh, next hour. Why It Matters to Be Catholic with Carlo Roussard. So that's pretty good Monday, starting off pretty good around here. Um, let's go to Tom in Tennessee. Uh, it, no, we just, sorry, we'll go to Robert in San Clemente, California, uh, listening on the Catholic Answers app. Uh, Robert, go ahead with your question for Trent. Hi, Trent. Hi, Cy. Uh, my question was just on defending the, the doctrine of the uh, real presence in the Holy Eucharist. And how, I guess, tips on that, but how the, there's so much, I see there's so much evidence in the early church fathers on the teaching of it, and then and kind of dealing with, uh, I'm raising two kids in, as, uh, in the Catholic sure. Church, young kids, but yeah, yeah, yeah. family, 
is even you know uh, fundamentalist or evangelical and, and Baptist and uh, and and like I'm trying to connect the dots how the reformers kind of rejected it too or or as you got away from the reformers kind of rejecting it when we see right. so much proof that it is the uh, the doctrine the true doctrine so how would I yeah how would I go about doing that mm-hmm. well I, I think. There's a lot of different arguments that a person can put forward to defend Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. But I think that one—well, there's two things one should be should focus on. Not just—because, I mean, I would be happy, by the way, if you got your email address to send you a copy of my book, uh, uh, The Case for Catholicism, where I go into that in more detail. So if we get your email address, I'll send you a copy of The Case for Catholicism, and it has all the— scripture references. But I think there's two overarching uh, ways of looking at the issue we need to remember. First, definitions are always key. We want people to understand we're not talking about a mere physical change in the sense of, you know, well, this is obviously is not literal flesh and blood in the sense that it has the appearances of flesh and blood, uh, to understand that what we are talking about is at a substantial level beyond what we can merely see in appearances. So I, I think that to, to help to get a really firm understanding of what we mean by real presence and that that's not misunderstood, so making sure we got our definitions figured out here. Um, and there's different metaphysical, philosophical ways to talk about it, but by real presence to say, I'm willing, cause, because there's other Protestants who say, oh yeah, I believe in the real presence. And I might say, well, do you? Like, would you kneel before the Eucharist for an hour in a chapel and say that you're kneeling before God. Catholics would, um, Mm -hmm. Orthodox would. I I don't think those same Protestants who say they believe in the real presence, I don't think they they would do that. Uh, I I think that number two, and this comes up a lot, I think I got an article for a a camo piece, (laughs) sorry, an idea for camo piece in talking to you. A lot of times we kind of play defense a little bit when it comes to apologetics. Like, I got to prove the real presence, and I got to prove baptism uh, regenerates us. Sometimes I think that we should ask other people who claim the opposite to make their case. Like when people debate baptism, we'll say, oh, okay, well, here's all the proofs, John 3, 5, 1 Peter 3, 21, Acts 2, 38, for, for baptismal regeneration. I might say, well, well, wait, wh- you prove to me, where does the Bible say baptism is just for showing people I'm Christian? Where does it say that? Where does the Bible say that the Eucharist that we receive is merely a symbol? It is merely something that is symbolic, that Christ is not truly present in it. It is, it is merely a symbol. The closest they might try to do is to say, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, and I cover that in my book, uh, but I would say, even there, is Jesus saying anything about the Eucharist? He's saying, this is a symbol? Or are you, in, are you making that interpretation based on a command he is giving us in relation to the Eucharist? So I, I would sometimes ask the other side to bear a burden of proof in that regard. But that's two overarching things. I'll send you my book, The Case for Catholicism, if you want to go deeper. And then, yeah, if you would like to um, do that, um, that would be great. And, yeah, stay on our call screener, and we'll, we'll get that to you. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate that. Tips for defending the faith this hour with our guest, Trent Horn. And let me see, there are two lines open right now. So your call is very, very welcome here. 888-318-7884 is the number. If there's some aspect of the Catholic faith that you don't find easily defensible or maybe defensible at all, you're, you're very welcome to call and ask for help. 888-318-7884. Noah in Tennessee. Watching on YouTube, you are up next, Noah. Go ahead with your question for Trent. Uh, hi there. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I'm a big fan, so appreciate it. Um, I was wondering, I've, I guess I have a two-parter to some degree, but the first part is... Uh, how can God have free will if he's incapable of sinning? And the second part is, uh, so what actually is human free will if it doesn't extend in a same in the same way that it does from God? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I would say that most understandings of free will is that a person has free will if they are able to make choices without their choice being determined by someone else or by something else outside of them. So if they are able to make a choice and they do that not because anything else has determined that they make that choice, 
then they have then they have free will. Now there are some philosophers who say that you can be determined to make a choice and still have free will if you want to if you are doing what you want to do for example these are called compatibilists they believe free will and determinism are compatible there are atheistic compatibilists like daniel dennett and there are theistic compatibilists namely calvinist theologians often defend a kind of compatibilism to say god determines what we do but we're we're still free in that regard i don't believe free will and determinism are compatible However, I do believe we have free will, and you can say God has free will, but there's a big asterisk I would need to put next to that. I'll explain what I mean when we come back from the break. Hang on. Uh, just a quick minute. We'll take we'll take that, this break and be right back with more tips for defending the faith with Trent Horn on Catholic Answers Live. Have you enrolled in the Catholic Answers School of Apologetics? Let me ask you a more important question. Do you believe as a Catholic that you have an obligation to share the Catholic faith? In fact, the Church has answered this question, and the answer is that all confirmed Catholics are obliged to share the faith. It's actually in canon law. Catholic Answers is here to help you fulfill that obligation. Our School of Apologetics courses will equip you to help all the people you come in contact with understand what the church teaches and why. A great place to start is with all the Catholics in your life. Learn the art of apologetics from the best of the best and start sharing the gospel today. Visit schoolofapologetics.com. That's schoolofapologetics.com. Here's a question. Is it really possible to be friends with someone who died 2,000 years ago? Maybe the problem is that we've grown way too comfortable with the story of Jesus. Nice man, right? Taught us to love one another, said not to judge people. We celebrate his birthday every year. It's time to put away this small, safe version of Jesus, says Cy Kellett. Nobody that bland could have transformed the world. In a teacher of strange things, Psy presents Jesus Christ undiluted by sentiment, with all his radical words and deeds uncensored. Do you know someone, your son or daughter perhaps, or maybe your mom or dad, who needs the friendship of Jesus Christ? Do you? Order your copy of A Teacher of Strange Things by visiting shop.catholic.com today or asking for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Did you know you can access Catholic Answers Live right from your phone or other mobile device? Download the Catholic Answers Live app today. The Catholic Answers Live app, available now on iOS and Android. Matt Swaim here. Tomorrow on the Sunrise Morning Show, we'll celebrate the feast of Pope St. Clement I by looking at his life and legacy with Mike Aquilina from fathersofthechurch.com. Now back to Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back. Catholic Answers Live. Trent Horn is our guest. And we are right at the middle of an hour of tips for defending the faith. If you have some area of the faith that you would like help defending, whether you need it defended yourself or whether there's someone else you would like to defend the faith to. And that can, you know, maybe you you have trouble defending the reasonableness of believing in God. Maybe it's uh, something very, very specific, like the Immaculate Conception. Whatever, uh, your call is welcome, 888-318-7884. Noah in Tennessee is on the line now with uh, Trent. And the question is, how can God have free will if he's not uh, capable of sinning? That doesn't seem like freedom. Yeah, and I would just say that I reject the idea that free will requires, uh, in order to be free, a person has to be capable of sinning. Uh, so it, it, I guess it really depends. It will depend on how you, how you decide, uh, how you define the term uh, free will. There really will. It's Because there's a variety of ways one can answer this question. Because then it gets to a bigger question. Will we have free will in heaven uh, even though we won't sin there? That if we have free will on he in heaven in the same way we have free will here on earth, and then what if somebody sins and the whole thing starts all over again? So let me peruse a few different ways to answer the question. So I, I think it's very clear that free will and determinism are incompatible. If you are determined, uh, you do not have, you don't have free will. 
I don't think, though, that free will requires, at its core, a choice between good and evil. Uh, for example, a person might only, in, in a certain event, uh, there will be three choices they could make, and they're all morally good. And a person will choose one of them. He can't choose all of them. I would say that person has free will, and they're, they're choosing in that case, even though they're choosing among many good options. Or they could be choosing among many amoral options, like whether you have Frosted Flakes or Cheerios for breakfast. Uh, that's, you know, you, the, you're making a free choice in picking one or the other when you're making that decision. So I don't think that the, the choice to sin is necessary for a being to be free. Uh, I do believe, though, that our choice, if especially if all of our choices are determined so that some other cause besides us makes our choices, I don't think how we can be free in any meaningful sense. Now, it could be the case that God gives a person grace or a special gift uh, that moves their will so that they are always capable of apprehending the good and choosing freely among only good things. This would be the case, for example, that uh, Mary was given special grace so that she never committed a personal sin. And it may be the case that God will uh, change our wills in this way in heaven so that we will still have free wills in heaven, but they'll have been changed in a way so that we are only freely choosing among certain good options. Now, some people could interpret this to mean that, well, God is determining us uh, or his presence in heaven will overwhelm us so that we do not choose evil again. So in one sense, you could say we are determined by something beyond us to never choose evil. So our free will, I think, might be restricted in some way in heaven. But, uh, but I, I do think that we will still be able to retain free will among good choices. Like, will I sing this praise to God or that praise to God? So then let's go back to God then. Does God have free will? Before the break, I said that one has to put a big asterisk next to the answer if I say yes, because God is not a person in the same way, like, God, God is not a creature like us, okay? So God is not sitting around thinking what he, what he wants to do, and he, he's not like us in that regard. God is timeless. He's perfect. He's all-knowing. He's unchangeable. He's or immutable, you would say. So God, everything exists for God in one perfect eternal moment. Now, God is free. The Catechism is very clear. God could have chosen to not create the world, for example. But God doesn't make a series of decisions like you or I do. Everything is in one perfect eternal moment to God that is present. But God is free to make in that, in that moment like an act of creation or not an act of creation. And so God is free because nothing outside of God determines what he will do. Only God does that because he just is pure existence or pure being itself. So there's nothing outside of God pulling God's strings. So he's not determined. So he's free. But I wouldn't say he has free will in the same way creatures do because he's not a creature in time like you or I. But God is not an impersonal force. God is not forced to create the world. The world is not a necessary emanation from God, as the Catechism says. Uh, rather, God is perfect being itself. And in an act of, of love, of free gift, he created the world and then chose to atone for its sins. So I hope that is uh, helpful, Noah, and I'm glad you called in. Thanks, Noah. Lots of folks on the line, so we'll keep moving. Uh, one line open right now, if you'd like to call with your question for Trent. Tips for defending the faith, 888-318-7884. We go now to Las Vegas. Daniel in Las Vegas, listening on Catholic.com. Glad to have you, Daniel. Go ahead with your question for Trent. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I'm currently in RCIA, and... Um, because of that, my Protestant friends are trying to get me not to go to the church. Uh, one argument that they gave me was that uh, every generation is going to have their flaws in interpreting the scriptures, and that's why you need to focus on the Bible and what it says. And they said that the church father's flaw was that they focused too much on philosophy, and they were affected by their um, culture in that time to think of things through mm. philosophy. So I was wondering how can I respond to that? Okay. Well, I guess what I would first ask them is, if they're saying, well, every generation has its flaws when it interprets scriptures, what is the flaw in this current generation? Uh, I think it would be, like, I would ask them, like, okay, but how do you know, like, so you're saying the Church Fathers looked at things through an incorrect framework or lens. Uh, how do you know you're not, you're not doing the same thing? 
Uh, and I, I, so I think that's one point I would raise is that, well, you've uh, made an objection that could apply to any age, not just the fathers. Number two, I think you could say that the fathers, as the catechism says, they are a witness to sacred tradition, but they're not identical to it. So when we read the church fathers as Catholics, we don't treat them as having being inspired in the same way the Bible is, but they are a witness to how sacred tradition or the unwritten word of God is lived out in the faith specifically to understand what scripture means. Uh, so I, I think that we can look to them as valuable witnesses. They're not necessarily uh, perfect in, their, in everything they write. Uh, many of them lacked important vocabulary that was necessary to communicate certain dogmas, like the Trinity, for example. But we do see them being the witnesses of these very early doctrines. Uh, so that's another point I would raise. A third point would be, I think I might ask for evidence, like, well, where do you think the Church Fathers, uh, the, the majority of them, made an error in focusing on philosophy and getting Scripture wrong. It's one thing to focus on philosophy and not as much on Scripture. doesn't mean that you're wrong, uh, but I might ask them, uh, and I don't know, I'll ask you if you don't have an example, that's fine, but is there a particular example that, like, they, where they would say the fathers got the Bible wrong because they did too much philosophy? Um, I think when we were talking, it was about the Eucharist, so I think they were mm. saying uh, trans transubstantiation can't be found yeah. in the scriptures just by reading it alone, and that the church fathers had to get it from philosophy because they couldn't get it from scripture. But he, you know what? Here's what's interesting about that. Uh, the term transubstantiation was formally defined, well, used formally in the 13th century at the Fourth Lateran Council. So it was used in the Middle Ages— and it was common among Western scholastic theologians, people like St. Thomas Aquinas, to use this kind of language and the philosophy of Aristotle to uh, try to understand what Scripture and the Fathers are saying. Because you don't have the Fathers talking about using Aristotelian metaphysics, for example, to explain the Eucharist. You see that more in the Middle Ages. Uh, of scholastic theologians, and we see that in medieval councils like the Fourth Lateran Council. So I would say, actually, what's interesting here, the fathers, just uh, the language that they use uh, is more of a real presence language, or uh, not, you know, they don't talk about the Eucharist and substantial change or things like that. The closest I've found is some of the Eastern fathers of the Church use a word called metastoichiosis, which in English would roughly mean trans-elementation. Uh, but rather, you just see them saying that this, the Eucharist we receive, is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ. And they just make these identifications, just the same way as Scripture does. So I think what I would ask them, I would just say to your Protestant friends, how do we reconcile this very literal language both in Scripture and in the early Church Fathers? And I think that the way that Aquinas and other scholastic theologians do it by using these Aristotelian categories of substance and accident uh, is the best way to understand that. Uh, so I, I think that's what I might um, share with them. Then I would also say that if they're Protestant, look, they're going to be using philosophy too. Like, if you read in just Scripture and even the early fathers, you don't have a robust philosophical defense of the Trinity or the Incarnation, or the hypostatic union. That comes later as we try to find terms that best explain the deposit of faith that has been revealed to us. So, um, yeah, I hope that was helpful for you, Daniel, and I'm grateful you called in. Daniel, uh, hang on for a quick sec. Uh, we, we have to take a break, but I, I think it might be helpful to you to read or to have in your possession and, and uh, thumb through uh, the Early Church Was the Catholic Church, the new book from our colleague Joe Heschmeyer, The Catholic Witness of the Fathers in Christianity's First Two Centuries, because one of the consequences of uh, modern thinking is this idea that somehow the Church got away from the teaching of Jesus to become the Catholic Church, and that is not the case at all. So if you want to hang on, we'll send you The Early Church Was the Catholic Church, the new book from Joe Heschmeyer, and we'll take a quick break and be right back with more tips for Defending the Faith with Trent Horn. Let us help you with your question today on Catholic Answers Live. 
Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro-life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. This is Dr. Ray Garandi from The Doctor is In. You call in and we will talk about what matters to you in your life. We can put our heads together to help you solve the problems of life and to use your faith to get even smarter. The Doctor is In with Dr. Ray Garandi. Tomorrow afternoon, 1 Eastern on EWTN Radio. We have a big problem. Our culture is dying and souls are in danger of being lost. The answer is conversion to Jesus Christ in His Church. St. Paul Street Evangelization is a Catholic organization and we have hundreds of teams spreading the good news throughout the country. But we need your help. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Find out more and get involved today at streetevangelization.com. That's streetevangelization.com. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Time is flying. Trent Horn is our guest this hour. Next hour, Carla Roussard will be here, and we'll talk about why does it matter to be Catholic. Uh, your call is welcome. That hour or this, 888-318-7884. We go now to Joshua in Michigan, listening on the Ave Maria radio app. We're glad to have you. Uh, Joshua, go ahead with your question for Trent. Hey, thank you uh, for taking my call. Um, sure. I'm a convert to Catholicism from Anglicanism, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad is still very much Anglican. And mm -hmm. we go in these roundabouts sometimes at uh, family dinners or whenever I come over to visit, and he brings up, like, Fox's Book of the Martyrs mm -hmm. um, right, and, yeah. and tries to bring up things like Mary's uh, Mary the First's uh, reign, which, you know, he calls Bloody Mary. And, so I'm just wondering what some tips and things I can say to people like the Catholic persecution under Elizabeth the first is nothing to be balked at, you know. Uh it's something mm. that I researched as I was becoming Catholic, you know. What were the English martyrs? But yeah, so that's my question. Yeah, I think what I would recommend here and uh there should be a um let me see if I can bring it up here actually. We could send it to you. I'd recommend others to check out. Um, my uh, fellow apologist, Dave Armstrong, has a blog over at Pathios Catholic. He's a prolific, prolific writer. Uh, he has a post called The Inaccuracies of Anti-Catholic Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, so, sim you know, this literature, uh, post-Reformation literature, things discussing the wars of religion and the conflicts that emerged between Catholics and Protestants uh, on on both sides, you can see uh, inaccuracies. But I've noticed among certain Protestants who uh, are who enjoy reading, especially like 18th, 19th century uh, rhetoric about the Catholic faith, some of that still bleeds over today among some Protestant critics of Catholicism, and it often tends to be highly inaccurate. Uh, I think I read somewhere saying that the Inquisition, uh, there were like 50 mil million people the Catholic Church had killed through uh, the Inquisition. Uh, and at some point, that would be more than like the entire population of Europe yeah. at that time in, in, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so some of these claims are very bombastic, and that's similar in Fox's Book of Martyrs. So I would commend you to Armstrong's post, Inaccuracies of Anti-Catholic Fox's Book of Martyrs, for the factual data. But I think I might, uh, with the person you're talking to, I think I just might ask some clarifying questions and just say, well, okay, yeah, so we can agree there was violent conflict between Catholics and Protestants uh, after the Reformation. Yeah, everybody agrees on that. Then I might say, okay, well, what does, the, what does that prove? Like, what would that say? Does that prove anything about the Catholic faith that some Catholic secular, some Catholic leaders, because we have to remember that at this time in world history, there was not a strict divide between church and state like we have today. So to work to undermine the church 
in many countries that religion was seen as a way of unifying a people and making sure a nation was strong to persevere against uh, invasions or anything like that. And so to undermine the church was seen as like an act of treason. Uh, and treason, of course, even today, can be punishable by death. Doesn't mean that was right what happened, but we understand that at that time in history, both Protestants and Catholics engaged in conflict with one another, usually because civil and secular aims were often tied up in religious goals uh, between people. And we can give thanks that we don't have that anymore between Catholics and Protestants. And so we're, we are in a better position to dialogue with one another about our faith because we're not as pressured to maintain certain national identities based on uh, our religious beliefs, because we live in a much more pluralist society. We often need one another to combat things like secularism. So I think I would ask him, you know, look, what does that prove? Like, does the fact that some Catholic leaders persecuted Protestants mean that Catholicism is false? If that is the case, what about the Protestant leaders who persecuted Catholics uh, and dro you know, said that they had to go to the, the New World? Or what about Protestants who persecuted other Protestants? Think about why the, why the, you know, the Anabaptists, for example, those who believed in rebaptism, they were kind of persecuted by everybody. <laughs> but you, know, you had Protestant sects that would uh, be in violent conflict with one another. So I think I might ask him like a very bedrock question, does that, if it proves Catholicism is false, it just as much proves that against Protestantism, because there are Protestants who fought against even fellow Protestants in violent conflicts. Uh, and just say that we recognize that happened in history. We can be thankful that historical circumstances have evolved since then. And we're in a better position to say, okay, well, which church, which religion, well, which church is, which, let me use my words here correctly, which Christian group, which denomination is has most faithfully kept and received the deposit of faith, and trying to focus on that and not getting lost in the weeds of historical curiosity. So is I mean is that a helpful um, hand, answer? Yeah, it is. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank Great. you, Joshua. Thanks very very much, uh, Trent Horn, our guest. Tips for defending the faith this hour. Let's see. We can probably get to everybody if we keep moving. James in Illinois watching on YouTube. You are next. James, go ahead with your question for Trent. Hi, Trent. Uh, so I have a good friend who is Hindu and mm. is open to learning about Catholicism. But unfortunately, I can't find very much at all that really looks into the differences between the two. Um, can't find anything that talks about how to introduce Catholicism, how to compare them, and, and it's also difficult because Hinduism is so culturally heavy. So I wonder yes. if you might be able to point me in the right direction. Well, this is another, would the word be a lacuna, I think? Uh, yes, this would be yeah, a lacuna. It is. It is an unfilled gap in studies. There's a, a lot of areas that we need more people to talk about evangelism and apologetics to reach particular individuals. Um, I think one reason we don't have a lot of these resources in the United States is because Hinduism is a very, very small minority religion here in the United States. I mean, it's only been a few times in my life that I've passed by a, a Hindu temple, for example. Uh, so I, I think we don't have a lot of resources here in this country. Uh, but there might be other resources that I, I would recommend. I, I think uh, one is if you're talking with someone who is Hindu, I think you can just find common ground with that person. Uh, what's interesting is there's some individuals who are highly critical of the Second Vatican Council for talking positively about Hinduism. But when we interpret the council correctly, I think it's trying to make inroads with this group of people. Uh, this is where it talks about how people have perceived a hidden power that hovers over the course of things and events of human history. It says, in Hinduism, men contemplate the divine mystery and express it through an inexhaustible abundance of myths and searching through philosophical inquiry. Now, I don't think it, it doesn't literally mean they contemplate God, because um, they mm -hmm. don't in Hinduism, but they're trying to understand that there is a greater reality beyond the physical, and there's this divine reality that permeates the world that they seek to understand. Uh, through meditation, through ascetical practices. And so we can find common ground to say, this is great. You want to know about the ultimate reality. What is it? And it's hard because Hinduism, and I'm not, I, I only have a cursory knowledge of Hinduism, 
But I know there's multiple ways mm -hmm. you can look at it, because one way to look at it is polytheistic, that there are many different gods, but other schools of Hinduism or ways of interpreting Hinduism will say the multiple deities in Hinduism are manifestations of like one universal presence or you know, the one or Brahman mm -hmm. or, or whatever it may be. So I think learning is important here. If you're gonna evangelize someone, learn what you can about their religion. We have a course at the School of Apologetics by my friend Joe Heschmeyer. It's a look at world religions. I don't know if it has Hinduism. I hope it does, because I'm it recommending does. Yeah, it. Yeah. it does, yeah, yeah. Oh, good, there you go. So schoolofapologetics.com. Okay. There is a course on world religions there by my friend Joe and colleague Joe Heschmeyer. That he covers Hinduism a bit. Uh, I would I would always point people to Jesus. That uh, uh, many Hindus have a high respect for Jesus. Some say he's a guru, and actually in my book Counterfeit Christ, I talk about how Jesus was not just some kind of Eastern guru, not the the Deepak Chopra uh, Jesus. So that kind of leans more into Buddhism. Right. Uh, then right. one last reference: uh, individuals that might have some insight here. You know what? I should ask them the next time I speak at their conference. Uh, I spoke a year ago at the Ciro Malabar Catholic Conference in Houston. The Ciro Malabar Catholic Church is the uh, Catholic Church, the rite that is celebrated in India. Uh, so these are uh, Indian Catholics, and their origin goes all the way back to when the Apostle Thomas, on his missionary journey, traveled to India to preach the gospel, and the rite that they celebrate goes back there. And so that would be the Ciro Malabar. And so some, and so I think if you know someone who is Hindu, connecting them with that Catholic community, uh, wherever you can find them, can be helpful because they might share many similar cultural beliefs uh, and practices, and they can kind of speak the same cultural language. And they might even be familiar with some people who write in Hindi or who are familiar with Hinduism who might be able to take a deeper, deeper look at it. So that's Ciro Malabar, rite or church, S-Y-R-O, M-A-L-A-B-A-R, Ciro hyphen Malabar. Those are a few different resources that I would that I would recommend on that subject. So I um, I hope uh, that that is helpful for you, James. Thanks, James. Uh, we'll try to get Smitty in now. I think we can do it. Smitty in Houston, Texas, listening on the Catholic Answers app. Can you be kind of quick with your question, Smitty? Uh, yes. Thank you, Cy. And uh, hello. And thank you, Trent, for this weekend. I had to listen to your talk twice. Um, oh, at Matt I'm Frad's conference. About Yes. Who forced uh, you to listen to his talk awesome. twice? <laughs> well, be, and he says he doesn't have a degree in this. I mean, I'm just amazed at how he grasps that stuff. But anyway, at the Last Judgment, when we're reunited, we're supposed to have resurrected bodies. And Correct. when our Lord resurrected, he moved through time and space. I guess it didn't exist. So wouldn't time and space not exist for us? And how is it that millions of us who are resurrected again gonna exist i can't get the time and space thing ah uh, yeah yeah but but it head. would be it would be probably hundreds of billions of people maybe and it's just one little earth is that where you're yeah going? Right. so that may be we're the all case going to texas refers to, right here's the revelation the new heaven and new earth um, and a new texas right uh that the new earth um would be a restoration or a redemption of the world. Uh, Romans talks about how the universe waits to be redeemed. Uh, God may uh, alter physical laws in the universe to allow more people to live on the earth or to change its size. You know, we, we don't know. He's God. He can do that. Uh, when it comes to time and space of the physical body, I would say that Jesus's body was subject to time and was within time and space. It is a body. It is extended, but it's glorified. So it's not a mere physical body. Uh, so Jesus possessed a kind of mastery over space uh, in walking through, like, locked doors, for example. Um, so, because uh, we think, for example, like our body, it's interesting, our body is mostly empty space. If you could rearrange the molecules, uh, you could possibly pass through solid objects if you had a complete control over the molecules in your body to maintain um, unity there. So fascinating stuff. I'll have to ask Jimmy Aiken to cover it on a mysterious world. Uh, but no, in the in heaven, in the next in the next life, we will be in time and space. We'll have resurrected bodies that will not be limited to what we have here on Earth. Smitty, thanks for getting that question out quickly. For a second there, uh, Trent, I thought you were going to say we'd be resurrected and we'd be we'd be much smaller, like the size of weasels or something. But I I, I misunderstood where you were going. Uh, TrentHornPodcast.com. Happy Thanksgiving, Trent. 
happy Thanksgiving, side to you as well. Carlo Broussard coming up next. Why bother being Catholic? We'll get into that right after this.